Thank you very much. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here for the 2014 United States Senator Dennis Chavez Endowed Lectureship on Law and Civil Rights. We are grateful to all of you for your support of the law school and this important lecture. Thank you for helping us to provide a warm welcome to many members of the Senator's family and extended family here today many of whom have joined us from across the country and as far away as Spain. And in welcoming our distinguished United States Senator Dennis Chavez lecturer, award-winning author and professor of law, Richard Delgado. We know the law school could not provide this level of intellectual engagement for our students, faculty, and our entire community without the support of all of you. So thank you. The members of the Dennis Chavez Foundation and Chavez family have, through their generous financial support of the law school, made this lecture series possible. Mrs. Tristani, I want to thank you for being here. Tristani, in fact, why don't all of you and your family members please stand up and, and get a round of applause for your generosity. Thank you. We are also grateful to see so many of our current and former judicial, legislative, and legal community members here today. We know there are an enormous number of public servants here today, some of whom were colleagues of the late senator, and many others who were certainly impacted and inspired by his life's work. Thank you for being here. It is now my pleasure to invite the senator's granddaughter, Sissy Coy, a member of the board of directors for the Dennis Chavez Foundation and a co-author of El Senador, a book on the life and times of the senator to the podium. Sissy, if you would please uh, come up here and uh, join me today. Good afternoon. On behalf of the family, a special welcome to all of you. That's special. <laughs> On the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, it is a fitting moment to review briefly the role that Dennis Chavez and like-minded colleagues played in laying the groundwork for this landmark legislation. From his boyhood days in New Mexico, Chavez displayed a crusading zeal for social justice. That zeal sprang in part from personal knowledge. Growing up, Chavez had firsthand experience with minority status, experience that continued with his election to Congress. During his time in the Senate from 1935 to 1962, he was the only Hispanic. Needless to say, there were no African Americans and no Native Americans. In the 1940s, Chavez was in the vanguard of those in the Senate fighting for fair employment practices for all Americans. In 1946, he co-sponsored Senate Bill 984, which would have authorized the Fair Employment Practices Commission and would have prohibited discrimination in the workplace based on race, religion, color, national origin, or ancestry. Advocating for the bill took persistence and courage. Opposition in the Senate was toxic and implacable. A powerful bloc of Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats known as Dixiecrats opposed any move to end discrimination. Without apology, Dixiecrats defended white supremacy, warning against the danger of social equality and miscegenation of the white and black races in the South. Mississippi's Theodore Bilbo, leader of the Dixiecrats, 
argued that the bill was unconstitutional and un-American. He would consistently refer to Chavez as the senator from Mexico. The senator from New Mexico corrected him patiently every time. But Chavez wasn't as, wasn't as patient with the status quo, saying, in the light of everyday American practice, intolerance, prejudice, bigotry, and discrimination are as American as a hot dog. On another occasion, he said, some time ago, the Congressional Medal of Honor was awarded to a boy from my section of the country who died in Attu in the Pacific. We give Martinez a medal for dying, but we refuse, refuse a job to his relatives or to his friend. And he insisted, we are all free or we fail. Democracy must belong to all of us. After a 24-day filibuster in the Senate, the Fair Employment Bill was defeated. 18 years passed before the enactment of the Civil Rights Act. Unfortunately, Dennis Chavez didn't live to see that day. He died in 1962. But despite the defeat of 1946, he had never stopped crusading for justice. In 1950, he confronted Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was denouncing homosexuals and Soviet spies and sympathizers in and out of federal government. McCarthy made his charges without substantive proof and without regard for constitutional principles. He was virulent and dangerous. He was also very powerful. Only a handful of senators dared oppose him, and Dennis Chavez was one who did. From the Senate floor, Chavez challenged McCarthy, saying, I should like to be remembered as the man who raised a voice at a time in the history of this body when we seemed bent upon placing limitations on the freedom of the individual. He went on, it matters little if the Congress appropriates hundreds of millions of dollars to check the erosion of the soil if we permit the erosion of our civil liberties and the untrammeled pursuit of truth." End quote. Among the accolades paid to Dennis Chavez, the word courage stands out. His contribution to justice in American society is an honorable legacy and brings us to today's lecture. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker, Richard Delgado is one of the leading commentators on race in the United States. He has appeared on Good Morning America, the McNeil Lear Report, PBS, NPR, The Fred Friendly Show, and Canadian NPR. He is a prolific author who has written more than 150 journal articles and 27 books. His books have won eight national prizes, including six Gustavus Myers Awards for Outstanding Books on Human Rights in North America the American Library Association's Outstanding Academic Book, and a Pulitzer Prize nomination. His career and book, The Rodrigo <coughs> Chronicles, were described by Stanley Fish, and I quote, Richard Delgado is a triple pioneer. He was the first to question free speech ideology. He and a few others invented critical race theory, and he is both a theorist and an exemplar of the importance of storytelling in the workings of the law. Professor Delgado is the co-editor with his wife and frequent collaborator, Jean Stefanik, of Critical Race Theory, The Cutting Edge. The third edition of this book, released in 2013, collects the best writing of a new generation of civil rights scholars. Professor Delgado received his JD from the University of California, Berkeley. He holds the title of Professor and John J. Sparkman Chair of Law at the University of Alabama Law School. His address today is titled, Delgado's Dark Room, Critical Reflections on Land Claims and Chicano Legal Education. It is my honor to invite Richard Delgado to the podium. Please join me in welcoming Professor Delgado. thanks to the law school, Dean David Herring, and the Tristani family for the opportunity to, to spend two glorious days here in this wonderful spot. Uh, this event, uh, as you know, honors the life and achievements of Dennis Chavez, a tireless civil rights cru crusader who attended Georgetown Law School at night in the uh, 1920s and maintained a lifetime interest in legal education. 
uh, two themes of my talk, civil rights and, and legal education. He sponsored, as you heard, equal uh, employment legislation and to defended the, the New Deal. He had uh, advocated for Indian rights and those of Puerto Ricans. Born in New Mexico to a large family before statehood, he became the, the first United States Senator to, to serve a, a full term. I'm honored to give a talk in this series uh, named after him and supported by his, his family who are here, uh, having flown in from uh, the, the East Coast and from, uh, from, from Spain. Thanks. Turning now to my talk, to dispel any, any suspense, critical race theory, which I'll describe in just a minute, is the dark room and the, uh, the photo, uh, photos soaking in the, in the, in the tub are um, uh, a series of, of land rights ca cases out of, out of which I, I hope to develop a, a, snap a snapshot um, of, um, concerning uh, Latino legal education. Uh, beginning in the late, late 60s, the cases I mean, beginning in the late 60s and, and continuing until, uh, until the present. Um, David, we're, we're getting feedback on this mic, so I'm going to move back. As you, as you might know, my, my, my first article out of, out of law school 40 years ago uh, was about the legal education of, of Chicanos. It was written in Albuquerque with two New Mexico professors, one of, one of whom I believe is, believe is here, and appeared in your law review, the law review of this, of this school. Between then and, and now, I've, I've written and, and, and spoken on a, on a host of topics, as, as you heard, but I keep coming back to, to this one. First, the dark room. As you may know, critical race theory has been ex expanding re recently in a number of, of directions. Um, like a photographer who is in the, in the process of broadening his, his practice from wedding portraits to, to photo journal, journalism and nature photography. Beginning in the early years, when, when scholars such as Der Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Mari Matsuda, and Margaret Montoya of this faculty, wrote uh, classic articles on uh, interest convergence, intersectionality, and legal storytelling, <clears throat> the movement has, has, has branched off in a number of directions, including critical Latino studies, critical race feminism, and queer quit, quit uh, theory. It also expanded to a number of other disciplines, including psychology, sociology, education, and post-colonial studies, as well as other countries such as England, China, New Zealand, Russia, and Australia, where scholars use it to, to understand the, the, the course of, of their own racial histories, such as the end of the, the white Australia policy in, in that country. It has also turned inward, uh, examining the politics of, of daily life. Uh, Jean Stefancic uh, shows how having it at, at one's disposal an array of critical tools can help one recognize critical moments in, in one, one's own life and take action. She points out how Derek Bell, for, for example, was able to seize upon such moments to, to challenge and entrench practices at certain institutions, leaving them in a better condition than they were before he arrived. In this talk, I'd like to move both inward and outward. In the, inward in the direction of, of soul searching and introspection, and outward, examining a series of land rights cases having to do with native title that have broken out in, in two foreign countries and two US states, all in a fairly recent period. Minority law lawyers did not play major roles in, the, in these cases which is where the soul searching comes in. Some of the cases drew uh, major inspiration from the work of non-lawyers, such as historians, itinerant preachers, um, uh, students. Why no lawyers, not even those of a critical disposition? For an explanation, we'll, we'll need to, to look at the politics of, of legal education in the early and mid-1960s when law schools were first instituting affirmative action programs and, and continuing up to today. I'll begin by describing the four early cases. Then I'll posit several possible explanations for the 
absence of minority lawyers from these early high stakes cases. The explanation that, that I think is the most likely one has to do with the structure and the ideology of, of legal education, particularly in the way we teach about law reform. I don't think we're doing a, 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 an extremely bad job of, of teaching in that area, but we could be doing a better one. Our darkroom, in, in, in short, needs an adjustment, maybe a better safe light or, or stronger chemicals. Let me begin with a bit of civil rights history, which will situate my puzzle and the terms in which I intend to, to address it. It also shows what's possible without too great an investment. In the 1930s, Howard Law School was a relatively small, or it was relatively small, with a small faculty and student body, mostly black, and a budget to match, uh, small, probably a little like some that you, you know. Uh, black civil rights <clears throat> then were relatively underdeveloped. This was before Brown versus Board of Education and the, and the 60s uh, Civil Rights Era Acts. And, and even the NAACP's legal arm was, was small, underfunded, and led for the most part by sympathetic lawyers, some of them white, who did it out of love, not money. Under Dean um, Charles Hamilton Houston, Howard Law School set out to change all that. Located in downtown Washington, D.C., Howard uh, was, a, was a small elite, a small elite, and focused on one thing, producing social engineers, as they called it, lawyers who could usher in so, social change. Dean Houston ma maintained close relations with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, and, <clears throat> and in his seminar taught students like Thur Thurgood Marshall, Spotswood uh, Robinson, and Robert Carter, uh, the, the latest theories to attack segregation and, uh, and other barriers to lack, uh, black progress. Many of those students would, would go on to work for the fund, uh, become famous warriors for civil rights, and later judges. Howard graduates were, were responsible for Shelley versus Kramer, the racial covenants case, Sweat versus Painter, the uh, desegregating graduate schools in, in Texas, Brown versus Board of Education, which declared separate but equal uh, pupil assignments and unconstitutional, and many other breakthrough cases. <clears throat> they also had a hand in enacting the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This small law school was probably more effective than Harvard or Yale in changing society, despite a budget probably one-tenth their size. <coughs> All this did not happen accidentally, uh, but by careful design. In his seminar, Houston, Dean Houston, conducted intense skull sessions in which he challenged promising students like Marshall, Carter, and Robinson to decide which sector of society was most in need of reform. Segregated schools, the workplace, housing, the criminal justice system, the entertainment in industry, and, and why? If schools, if education, uh, which level would you challenge first? K through 12 schools? graduate schools, undergraduate schools, and in what order? And in which court, state or federal? Before which judge? And under what legal theory? Equal funding, desegregated pupil uh, uh, school assignment, and with the aid of what social science evidence? What role for poor whites in all of this? What role for grassroots organizing in, in, in protests? Are you going to proceed cautiously and incrementally, hoping to build momentum, or, or press for a Supreme Court decision as soon as possible? And so it was that the, that the fund, with these promising students now graduated and working for it, conducted a decades-long, highly strategic campaign leading up to Brown versus Board of Education, probably the most significant breakthrough for black civil rights of all, of all time. Their example proved so notable that Professor Gerald Rosenberg, who is skeptical of the possibilities for social reform through law, points out in, in the new edition of, of his book, The Hollow Hope, how gay rights activists have borrowed from the NAACP's campaign, consciously or not, in their struggles to repeal the military don't ask, don't, uh, don't tell policy, and state prohibition against, uh, prohibitions against uh, same-sex marriage. 
But gay and lesbian activists have not been the only ones paying attention. As uh, Stefanczyk uh, describes in a, in a recent book, conservative forces beginning in the late 1970s mobilized a multi-pronged campaign that included pseudo-scholarship, programs for promising conservative students, college students, legislative advocacy and lobbying, and litigation to roll back the gains of the, of the 60s, uh, the ones that the, the senator work, work, worked for, and set the country on a, on a more conservative, pro-business course. Their strategy suggested nothing so much as a carbon copy of the NAACP's, but of course in, in reverse. Gene, who writes about Latinos as well, could not help but being struck uh, by the, the conservative attack gathering force right now on ethnic studies pro programs, starting at the K through 12 level, but with university level uh, ethnic uh, studies departments as the final prize. In an upcoming article, she sh shows how that uh, machine trained its attention on a highly successful program of Mexican American studies in, in Tucson, Arizona, administering defeat after defeat, first at the level of public discourse and opinion, then uh, in a wide-ranging statute banning classes in American, Mexican American literature and, and history, then when the Tucson community sued for relief, administering defeat after defeat in court. As our third grade teacher told us, planning counts. Now let's look at the, at the four land, land, uh, land reform cases, beginning with the one from Australia. Mabo versus Queensland uh, began in the late 1970s when Eddie Mabo, N-A-B-M-A-B-O, a Tories Strait native, told a friendly history professor on the mainland campus where he worked as a, as a gardener about his desire, the uh, gardener's desire, to reassert his, his rights to a tract of land in an offshore island that had belonged to his, his family for as long as anyone could remember and dating back to before Captain Cook supposedly discovered Australia in 1770. The family didn't re re recall ever selling it to a white settler or losing it to the government uh, by eminent do domain or any other legitimate form of governmental taking. But now uh, Australia was treating the land as though it was theirs, um, Australia's, as though they could, they could ignore native title. They had even denied him permission to leave the mainland, where he worked, and go back to visit it. It turned out that for, for, for many years, dating back to the era of colonization and, and settlement, Australian courts had been following the doctrine of terra nullius, N-U-L-L-I-U-S, or null land. The idea was before the English settlers arrived, no one owned the land. Since the natives were relatively few in number, and their cultural and economic conditions not very advanced, at least to British eyes, the natives could not assert title to the land on which they lived, hunted, uh, or raised their young. Even though they might pass, pass over it or live on it for various periods of time, their use of it did not rise to the level of, of ownership in, in, in the British sense, uh, with fences and titles and plats and meets and bounds entries in the recorder's office, uh, mortgages and stuff like that. So in their eyes, it's a bit like uh, finding a five dollar bill on the, on the sidewalk next to, a, next to a dog. You are under no obligation to ask the, the dog, excuse me, Mr. Dog, is, is that by any chance your, your five dollar bill? The dog is not the sort of creature that can enter into a legally cognizable relationship with, with, with money. You might be in an, 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 an obligation to inquire with a human being who might be nearby and looks as though he, he, he might have dropped it, but you wouldn't have to ask the dog. Those of you who have studied American legal history will recognize the, the resemblance between the, the British doctrine of terra nullius, which formed the legal basis for the occupation of the entire continent of Australia, and the doctrine of discovery, dating back to John Marshall's uh, 1823 opinion in the Supreme Court decision Johnson, Johnson versus McIntosh. In McIntosh, the, the, chi the Chief Justice wrote that the European nations 
followed the practice of ceding rights to each other over land in the New World, that's North America, based on uh, first arrival in order to avoid un 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 unseemly disputes among themselves and killing fellow white people, as well as to promote stability and rights over land in the New Continent. Thus, the Spanish, the Spanish got Florida, uh, the Brits, New York, and much of Canada, the French got Haiti, and so on. It wasn't necessary to ask the, the native people first any more than you would have to ask uh, Mr. Dog about the uh, $5 bill. Eddie Mabo and the, the professor uh, gathered oral evidence, this will be significant in a minute, for five years, then convened a, a student conference on, on land rights in, in Australia, the outcome of which was a, a decision to file a land claim on behalf of the Torres Strait uh, Islanders. In Mabo, the High Court of Australia, for the first time, subjected the doctrine of terra nullius to searching examination and found it wanting, thereby throwing into question the ownership of much unoccupied land in that vast country. When the settlers arrived, the High Court held, the Crown had not, in fact, regarded terra, uh, Australia as, as terra nullius so that any settler could occupy any tract he, he felt like, put a fence around it, and ask any natives on it to leave. Instead, the Crown ex expected the settlers to, to negotiate with the Aborigines in light of the degree of civil, civilization in which they found them and arrange to buy, rent, or trade for the land. In, in other words, uh, don't, don't treat it like, like the $5 bill on the, on the, on the sidewalk. <coughs> In the wake of Mabo versus Queensland, Australia has been holding hearings, and I'm still doing it, I believe, and turning over vast reaches of that continent to the Aborigines, much to the displeasure of the mining industry, I might, I, I might add, which had its eyes on, on much of it. A lot of the research on, on, on which the, the High Court uh, based its uh, opinion in Mabo came from Henry Reynolds, uh, history professor that I mentioned, whose book, The Law of the Land, stemmed from the above-mentioned conversation with, with the gardener, the university's gardener, Eddie, Eddie Mabo, as well as from the student conference. I might mention that, that Reynolds has not been resting on his laurels. He's reportedly now hard at work researching the doctrine of sovereignty with a view to discovering whether the, the basis on which the Anglo government has, which has been, uh, has been ruling Australia for the last two centuries to, to see whether it, it is sound or not. If he decides it is not, and the courts agree with him, the country presumably would need to go back and do everything all over again, uh, presumably this time with the participation of the, of the Aborigines, if this sounds ludicrous to you. Uh, uh, bear in mind that Henry Reynolds is batting one for one. In Canada, a somewhat similar process of land redistribu redistribution took place after the Canadian Supreme Court handed down Calder versus British Columbia in, in 19, 1973, excuse me, which clarified that the arrival of European settlers in a region did not extinguish a native rights to the land, just by virtue of their showing up. And in a later case, Delgamook versus the Queen, the same court upheld the use of oral testimony by First Nation claimants seeking to defend their titles to land in Canada by showing continuous occupancy. You can, I'm sure, appreciate the importance of, the, of this holding, Dalgamook, which ends by decisively reminding readers of the opinion, we're all here to stay. The main impetus for land reform decisions in, in Canada seems to have come not from lawyers, but a, a coalition of, of tribal elders uh, who began meeting uh, before the turn of the century to air grievances, including ones having to do with land, and to petition the government, which they did. <clears throat> before their success in, in court in, in Calder, evidently a few Canadians of, of European origin questioned the traditional uh, system of land tenure 
under which nearly all of Canada was in the, in the hands of, of whites, who either owned it directly or, or, or managed it for the, for the general public. <coughs> The third of my cases has a New Mexico angle and began in the late 1960s when an itinerant preacher named Lopez Reyes Tijerina, with very little formal education, became gripped by the conviction developed in the course of research in various libraries, including the county law library, that the Kit Carson National Forest still belonged to the Mexican American people in the region, rather than Smokey the Bear. For, for those of you who not, visit, not visited Carson National Forest, it's located in the northern part of the state. And it's very beautiful, like many national parks and, and forests that you might have visited, with trails, campsites, uh, horseback riding, rangers' offices, and a visitor center. Accompanied by a few of his men, Tijerina occupied the park, declared it property of the people, and captured two park uh, rangers uh, who happened to be, be there and tried them in an impromptu people's court for trespass and being a public nuisance. After con convicting them, they, the, the tribunal mercifully let them go on condition that they behave themselves in the future and, and desist from interfering with other people's property. The United States government, as you might suspect, was not at all amused. It quickly captured charged and convicted Tijerina and, and his men, and the park today remains just as it was before this quixotic uh, co conflict, but not before the, the Tijerina organization filed a, a number of classically legal cases, including one, Tijerina versus Henry, federal court decision, that grapples for the first time with whether Mexican American, uh, Americans, like his followers, are a legally cognizable class for purposes of, of, of suing uh, a class suit to desegregate the, the public schools. The court held no. Within a few, a few years, Congress was receiving enough queries about land claims in, in the Southwest, particularly the state, like the one that riled Tijerina and his men, that it asked the Government Accountability Office, GAO, to, to research these, these claims, determine where, whether any, one of, uh, any of them were, were valid, and if so, what, if anything, the government ought to do about them. The GAO issued a, a long report in, in June 2004 entitled uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo Findings and Possible Options Regarding Longstanding Community Land Grant Claims in New Mexico. The 200-page report describes the abuse-ridden system by which Anglos had dispossessed many uh, Mexicans of their lands in the early days of Anglo rule and lays out a number of options that Congress could take in re redressing some of them. One of the options was, was simply returning the land to the Mexicans who, who lost it via fraudulent lawsuits. Tijerina may have taken a, a beating in, in court and in the court of public opinion, particularly after a subsequent courthouse raid, but thanks to the gray-suited bureaucrats in the, in the Government Accountability Office, he may still have the last laugh. The fourth incident took place a few years later when a, when a land developer in southern Colorado, just the other side of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains where Tijerina had created a short-lived ruckus, closed a large, tra large tract of land, many tens of thousands of, of, of acres, to the local residents, many of whom were Mexican Americans who had been in the practice of of using it for hunting, fishing, and gathering water and, and, and firewood. Uh, th this practice of theirs stemmed from a, a document written by a French-Canadian settler named Beaubien in 1863, shortly before his death, and only a few years before, uh, after the land had become part of the United States. A wealthy landowner, Beaubien, had uh, encouraged many of his, his friends and neighbors to settle on his, his land, apparently wanting their, their company and maybe labor. His instrument granted them the above-mentioned rights, hunting, fishing, and so on, uh, which his successors uh, continue to honor over the intervening 100 years. That is, until Jack Taylor, lumber merchant from North Carolina, bought the land, arrived on the scene, and locked the gate. Perhaps having heard of Tijerina's escapades in the neighboring states, 
the locals, after doing a lot of lay research, filed suit against uh, Taylor to enforce their rights to, to continue to use the land as they and, and their answers, ancestors had, had done for 100 years. This in turn required the Colorado Supreme Court to, to construe the meaning of the, the Bobien document, as they call, called it, against a background of the times, meaning the period just before and after nor, uh, northern Mexico became the United States. The story had a happy ending when uh, just a few years ago, uh, pro bono lawyers prevailed on the Colorado Supreme Court to find in the townspeople's favor. This is part of a, of a longer and, and very interesting uh, story about what, relevant, what law is, uh, is relevant to apply to a contract dispute centering around, centering around the meaning of, of key terms in a document that entered into force at, at a time when uh, Mexican habits and traditions still ran strong uh, because, it until, because until very recently the sovereign had been in Mexico, and, and, uh, uh, which is sought to be enforced, the document was sought to be enforced uh, today, uh, when the sovereign is, of course, the United States. But that's not the point that I want to explore today. Rather, it's the role of native lawyers, or Chicano lawyers, in each of these cases. In most of them, it's negligible, even though these are the very groups who are, who are suing for for, for relief, the, the plaintiffs, that is. Uh, in Mabo, the Australian case, the driving force, as mentioned, was a non-lawyer, Henry Reynolds, a historian, together with some of his students. In the New Mexico case, it was an uneducated migrant preacher, unaided by any lawyer, even though his cause was obviously not baseless, or else Congress and the, and, the, and the GAO would not have taken the action they, they did, namely taking the claim seriously. In Colorado, MALDIF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, was nowhere, nowhere to be seen. And the main lawyers listed in the opinion, Lobato versus Taylor, do not have Spanish surnames, but Jewish ones. And they seem to have been working in their spare time, pro bono. In the recent Tucson schools case, having to do with Mexican-American studies that I, I just mentioned, the attorney of record is a local practitioner named Mar Martinez, but he seems to have had little help until the case reach, reached the Ninth Circuit, where it is right now, with a record badly uh, loaded against it. Although the case is vitally important, with the potential reach almost equal to that of the school desegregation cases that the, at the NAACP litigated on their way up to Brown, it seems to have enjoyed very little support from the Mexican-American cause. With the three American cases, one is tempted to ask, or I ask, why not? By the time Tijerina was peering at land records in the county recorder's office in a little town in northern New Mexico somewhere, and records in Mexico City at the, in the National Archives, uh, trying to figure out which, uh, which land grants in northern uh, New Mexico came from the, uh, the king of Spain at, at which dates. And the light, was, a light bulb was starting to come on. Arizona State, where, where I started my teaching career uh, around this time, the Uni University of Arizona Law School, and this school, were, were turning out Indian and, and Mexican uh, lawyers in substantial numbers, probably near the, the numbers that they are turning out uh, today, or close to it then. Yet few of these lawyers were anywhere to be found in these landmark cases. Puzzlement over the missing legal talent deepens, or mind deepens anyway, when we glance a couple states over to include California. There, Cesar Chavez's farm workers union had a, law, had a lawyer named Cohen, who evidently was a man of courage. At any rate, he had his head bashed in a demonstration on behalf of La Causa but not a Chicano. It was not for lack of trying. I uncovered a, a, a letter from Sesser himself beseeching California Rural Legal Assistance, which then was staffed by many Chicano lawyers for help in its struggle against the powerful growers with their army of strike breakers, high paid lawyers, and heavy hitting thugs. They received a brusque reply reminding them that CRLA, CRLA, California Legal Assistance, had its own priorities 
and was in no, in no position to be anybody's personal lawyer, not even Cesar's. Latino lawyers during these, busy, these years were busy, writing wills, defending criminals, and suing for a divorce. Others helped small businesses incorporate, ran for mayor in small towns, sued for back pay on behalf of blue collar workers, and otherwise performed much ordinary legal work, doing certainly a lot of good, at least for their clients at the time. But this work is like putting in rivets in a, in a metal beam in a construction project. Sometimes one wants an imaginative engineer or architect who, th who can think of a, of a better way of building a bridge or, or skyscraper, or that is more secure than, than one secured with rivets. Others were doing this, this law reform work, but they were preachers, historians, or law students, some of them Anglo, or at any rate, non-Latino. This begs for a reason. I've thought of several, and I accept my, my own complicity in, in, in some of them. In the remainder of this talk, I, I advance a, a few, including my own top choice, which I'll come to in a minute. I know here that we enter into, into two realms, causation and the human mind, that are notoriously tricky or, or subjective. Everyone has an opinion. And even if they haven't until this point, they, they, they often feel free to deposit one. And I imagine some of you will too. But the, the question why so, so few minority lawyers in these important land right, right cases is not entirely subjective, indeterminate, and determinate, or irrelevant like much of jurisprudence or the debate over, say, uh, rules and principles. Quite a lot turns on the answer. Lawyers wield real power so that how we teach can, can orient future lawyers in this direction or, the, or that. They will be attuned to this kind of inequ social inequity or not. They will miss possibilities in a situation that a historian might see or vice versa. The courses we teach and the way we teach in them is apt to make a big difference in the world years into the future, shaping the destiny of entire regions or continents. One set of explanations would center on the agency of the, the lawyers themselves. An early generation of, of Latino lawyers might have realized full well that land claims like the, the two I mentioned in the American Southwest, or the one on behalf of Latino school children in Tucson now, were, were colorable, as the lawyers uh, say, but nevertheless decided not to pursue them. Laura Gomez's book, uh, Manifest Destinies, the, the uh, making of the Mexican-American race, shows how 100 years earlier, Mexican elites in this state went along with the new uh, uh, Anglo regime, which needed many low-level administrators, sheriffs, and small-town mayors to keep order over the much larger Spanish-speaking population. Much as the Brits in colonial uh, India offered mid-level mid jobs in the civil service to, to courteous and well-educated Indians, middlemen, in exchange for their tacit promise not to lead an insurrection, the establishment may have communicated to many Chicano lawyers that their role was to keep the, reg the region running smoothly, not to file since it could turn the, the social order upside down. Self-interest has, has a way of encouraging a, a, a cautious view of one's role and destiny. This sort of caution could easily become a habit and attitude so that Chicano lawyers, even non-elite ones from the working class, might have shied away from litigation that could earn the disapproval of the local establishment, and the same today. Gomez's book points out a second possibility. Changes in, in land rules sought, sought to bring great financial gains to those on the winning side. Statehood, for example, stood to triple the value of New Mexico land. The Carson National Forest would obviously today be a much lower value to, to thousands of, of tourists and lovers of nature if it changed hands and, and reverted to the surrounding community. Similarly, the Australian mining industry was at first greatly perturbed over the possible consequences of the Mabo decision since they wanted un undeveloped land to be available later just in case it turned out to have mineral deposits on it. It preferred the land undeveloped, fallow and cheap in other words, just the opposite of Kit Carson Park. History suggests that this possibility is not far-fetched or unduly harsh. 
In the years following the war with Mexico, many Mexican-American Mexican opportunists conspired to transfer collectively owned lands to land speculators such as Thomas Catron, who became wealthy in this way. So many vi villagers lost communal land in this fashion, a process that the, that the Supreme Court later uphold in United States versus Sandoval, 1897, and a few other cases. Um, so many cases uh, went in that direction that a bitter insurrection, the Gorras Blancas, White Caps movement, sprang up. So one reason for the low representation of, of minority lawyers in the recent, <coughs> the more recent 20th century cases that I mentioned may have been that they were not uninterested in them, they were just on the other side. Rodolfo Acuna, the prominent Chicano studies writer and historian, writes in a recent edition of his foundational book, Occupied America, of the rise of the broker class, by which he means minorities who occupy positions such as marketing director, mediating between pro powerful corporations and, and their com the minorities' communities, selling them cigarettes, liquor, and luxury items that they often cannot afford, or securing, vo securing votes for a, a, a political candidate. <laughs> These jobs resemble, as I mentioned, uh, the ones that the, that the British offered to educated Indians <coughs> helping to rule the country during the colonial occupation, except that the, 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 the latter uh, jobs pay a lot more. In Colorado, by the, the late 1960s, Mexican-American Mexican -American lawyers were no doubt practicing in the southern part of the San Luis Valley, where the Taylor Ranch is, is located. But they may, they may have hoped for, for business representing the Anglo developer, and so re refrained from representing the Mexican farmers, since the farmers represented few business opportunities for the lawyers, but the developer did. But I think that an even more likely explanation places the reason not so much at the doorstep of the, the early Chicano lawyers, but of legal education, which is where self-introspection -intro comes in. As one who began teaching in the, in the era when the, the two U.S. cases, Tijerina and Lovato, arose, I think legal education may have been responsible for three related reasons. The first is simply that we taught them white people's law. When affirmative action brought substantial numbers of, of Latinos, blacks, and Asian Americans, Indians too, uh, to law school for the first time in the late 60s, we did not at the same time change the law schools that would receive them. Rather, we expected the newcomers to adapt to, to them, to us. And so we, we, taught, we taught them the usual courses, civil procedure, contracts, torts, criminal law, property, and, and, and so on, that, we, that we'd been teaching all along, and in much the same fashion, namely Socratically, and with an emphasis on the classic cases, Anoyer versus Neff, Regina versus Dudley and, and, and Stevens and so on. It should be no surprise then that the, the brown and black lawyers that we turned out then went on to careers that were in most cases very much like those of their, their white classmates with perhaps a few more solo practitioners and legal services lawyers mix, mixed in. Even students of color who arrived planning to be <coughs> radical lawyers, defending draft dodgers, militants, and communists would tell us that after a year or two of, of, of law school, their aspirations had turned more conventional. <clears throat> we did little to dissuade them. Some of us might have even cheered the prospect of minorities tracing con conventional career paths, just like everyone else. Consider that around this very time, elite universities, like Harvard and Berkeley, were purging the ranks of white leftist professors, professors out of concern that they might teach the new minority students who were marching up the ladder, the educational ladder in the years after Brown versus Board of Education and would soon be knocking on the doors of the, these elite schools. Top educators had just been through a harrowing period, the 60s, when student riots and, and demonstrations roiled campuses and were in no mood for more of the same, particularly for minorities who might have even more justification for being contented, discontented than the upper class white students who had given them such a hard time just a few years earlier. College presidents most certainly did not want the new impressionable minority undergraduates 
learning social analysis from closet Marxists and socialists. Hence the purge that began around 1970, went on for a few years, and cost many hundreds of university professors their jobs and careers. Might law school's cautious response to the new minorities have been part of the, the same reaction? Except for Howard, few law schools set out to teach blacks and brown, black and brown students to look for opportunities to overturn the, the social order, and not many more of them do so now. The, the, the Koch brothers recently sponsored a, a guide for the Republican Party on how to ingratiate itself with, with Latinos. <coughs> it makes really interesting reading, if you can find it on the internet, and uh, turn them into right-thinking clones of upper-class suburban whites. Might some of us have, have conducted a quieter version of this campaign with our own minority students, doing our best to turn them into middling practitioners who would go on to careers indistinguishable from, the, from those of the rest? That is, defending criminals, incorporating small businesses, helping couples divorce, writing wills, and drafting contact, contracts. Nothing is wrong with this, any of this, of course. It helps the wheels of America turn around. But sometimes the wheels need recalibrating or a determined push that will get them going in a different direction. Here is where we may have fallen short. If so, if so we had a lot of help. The Ford Foundation was giving OEO grants to community activists like Jorge Gonzalez in hopes of turning them away from militant action toward community economic development, that is to say, capitalism. Ford was also helping establish moderate, organiza moderate organizations like MALDEV, getting a foothold in the Mexican-American legal community and, and assuring itself a piece of the action there. The American intelligence community kept a close watch on radical groups, particularly ones of color, and even Martin Luther King himself. The State Department was so fearful of the threat of, of Latin American communism, as well as the domestic kind epitomized by Emma Temayuca's Pecan Workers Union, that it may have prevailed on the Supreme Court to decide Hernandez versus Texas, a 1954 companion <coughs> case to Brown versus Board of Education, as it did second spectacular breakthrough designed in part to send a, re a message to the rest of the world that the U.S. was not all southern sheriffs, police dogs, and all white cherries that excluded Mexicans. If we want to equip our students, particularly ones of color, to be agents of change, we will have to resist pressures like these, grants, honors, and so on. We will need to change the way we teach so as to give our students the, the necessary tools, including curiosity, an enlarged imagination, and the determination to do something about large-scale injustices that most people take for granted, just how things are. This may not win you popularity contests or, or, or a government grant, but it may be a good thing to do anyway. I'm reminded of the man who went down to the river on hearing a friend call for, for help. The friend was waiting in the water, beckoning to, to come and help. He had just rescued a, a baby who was floating down the, the river in a basket. And, and the man could see others floating downstream in the, in the same direction toward him. The second man helped his friend rescue one or two, then left the river, shook his clothes off, and began striding <coughs> determinedly upstream. Where are you going, his friend cried. Are you going to help, help me rescue more babies? Here, here comes some, come some more. No, the man replied, I'm going to take a, look, take a look up river to see who's putting all those babies in the water and try to do something about it. We might need to equip our students with, with not just the, uh, the instincts and, and tools to carry out river rescues, but also the curiosity and, and determination to discover and fix what is causing the release of, of all those babies into a dangerous condition. This, I believe, is what Senator De Dennis Chavez, a true man of the people, would have wanted and would have made him proud. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Delgado. Um, Professor Delgado has agreed to take a few questions tonight, uh, if we have questions. And I believe we have some microphones around if you want to ask a question. So please go ahead. I have a question, mostly because I did not understand very little of what you said, because maybe you could speak the wrong. But I'm on Fulcher Sanchez. I was district attorney 
enduring with the Erased Open the Arena Insurrection. And I'm here, I'm happy I'm here. Uh, I noticed uh, books have been written and so on, but I, did, I wanted your input. Dennis Tavis was my mentor. I graduated from this law school in 1957, and I've been lawyering in Santa Fe since then. Uh, and I was in the attorney, unfortunately or fortunately, but I was involved in that as district attorney. I heard that it once or twice to work the even, but I want your input of how it is or what your input is on whether or not what he did or he was proposing to do. And I haven't written my book. If you write a book, you want to write my book, I might <laughs> to give my side of it or see whether what I did. And we were up to the US Supreme Court on the issue of whether civil rights were violated or not. But I'm here specifically to find out from you when you feel, because you didn't call me on what my input was, or I have uh, given my notes on what happened here at the UNM Library, Law Library, but whether or not what the race did, I sort of feel like I prevented another civil uh, Mexican-American war. And here I am, uh, but we need input like from guys like you that are professors that can analyze and see what happened and see if you evaluate it, whether I as district attorney at the time violated any law involving the civil rights of Braves or any of his followers in what they did on June 5th, 1960. I'm sure he violated many laws, and uh, I'm sure he violated uh, uh, many laws. And, and, uh, I'm sure he violated many laws, and, and I'm sure you, as a lawyer, know that uh, very often bad people make bad laws. Good people often make good laws, but sometimes bad people make good laws. In the in the other way around, um, I, I, I don't um, I don't pass judgment on his his character or what he what he might have done um, aside from uh, bringing certain land uh, grievances to the attention of the of the legal community and eventually Congress, uh, which decided to take seriously the, the issue that uh, that he, um, he 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 was raising. So uh, I. I Whether you're answering my question of whether there were any civil rights violations during the June 5th incident, 1967, in New Mexico? No, probably, but that's not my point. My, my, I was, my talk is about legal education. He, he was not a lawyer. If, if he'd been a lawyer, uh, trained, to, uh, trained to, to think imaginatively, Perhaps he wouldn't have proceeded the, the, the way he the way he did. If he'd had a lawyer, maybe you, um, perhaps he would have proceeded um, more, uh, uh, more more suavely uh, than he did. Uh, perhaps he wouldn't have uh, been, been as, uh, as as impetuous as, as he did. But but he, he was what he what he was, and, and his, his mark on history is um, uh, what what I described. You're you're asking me about about different aspects of, of his character, whether he violated other laws. The answer is probably, I'm sure, I'm sure he did. I'm not, I'm not so sure you will, but uh, <laughs> thank you for asking. There's some other questions. Professor Delgado, my name is Tianza Valencia Sapien. I'm a graduate of the Arizona State University School of Justice Studies, as well as the Law School Class of 2009. I'm a proud graduate of the School of Law. 
My question to you is, can you provide some examples of what some contemporary law schools are doing, that, that they're doing that are in the spirit of what you said? Uh, what are, are your schools doing things right, and are there examples of what uh, could change in, in American legal education to do the type of thing that you're doing? Are there programs out there that exist? Are there models? Uh, a few here, here and there, but, but none as, as specific and, and, and concentrated at, as Howard um, Law School in the period that I, uh, that I mentioned. Um, here and there you, you have uh, imaginative law professors teaching, uh, well, inventing uh, the idea, of, for example, of the Innocence Project. Um, Barry Sheck at, uh, at Cardozo Law School is certainly one who was, was changed uh, the, uh, an entire paradigm in the, in the way we, uh, we, we, we think of, of, of crime and, and, and punishment, and particularly the, uh, the death penalty. Um, but no, no, no law school really has a, has a, has a corner on the, on the market right now, and I, I wish some, uh, some, some, would, some would make an effort to, uh, to do so. Um, you have clinical cor courses that, that, that try to equip uh, students with the with, with the tools uh, to litigate, but, but much lit much of what they teach students to do is within the, the current paradigm. And if that paradigm uh, is, is by its terms not particularly uh, change oriented or not particularly fair, or if it re reflects a, a certain power uh, distribution. Uh, then it, uh, it, it really takes students who, who are prepared to step outside that paradigm, look at it, evaluate it, and, and, and try to try to change it. And we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, too few uh, classes of, of that sort. Gene uh, and I are working on one right now at, uh, at Alabama, but I won't bore you with that. Okay, we'll do one more question if there is one up. I want to thank Professor Delgado and thank you all for being here with us today and providing us with um, the insights, Professor Delgado, that mark the senator and his remarkable life's work and impact on civil rights. You've honored us all with such a thought-provoking lecture. I am personally very grateful that you accepted this invitation to speak. And again, I'd like to thank you for enlightening us today with your words and for the time you and Jean have graciously taken out of your schedules to be here. Before we all adjourn for our reception, we'd like to present Professor Delgado and the members of the Tristani family and Chavez families with our appreciation. Will the men members of the Senator's families please join me on stage or up front if you can. Okay, and will you all join me in one round of applause for our lecture today? And Richard, I've kind of lost you, but we'd like to present you with a nom de piece of art. Uh, and thank you for the lecture again. Um, and your role is the University of New Mexico School of Law, United States Senator Dennis Chavez, lecturer. I hope that you will all now join us for a reception with our distinguished lecturer and our special guests. Again, thank you for being here tonight for a very special evening. Thank you.